the dingo. Icon of Australia. Noble survivor in a tough land. Dogs can go three weeks without a drink. They're not getting their water from a dam. They're getting their water out of blood and fat reserves they've got in their body. A friend and protective spirit for thousands of years. The dingo has inserted himself into the ecology. It's the type of country that they are absolutely perfectly built for. A wild dog with a bad reputation. Dingo's got my baby. A threat to our families. The two children were walking along this track when they were attacked. And frenzied demon to our livestock. It's a horrible, horrible, horrible death. All they want to do is kill. But could dingoes actually be the farmer's friend? Dingoes killed seven out of seven foxes within 17 days. Do we need them to balance our environment? We can recover threatened species and ecosystems simply by allowing the dingo to do what the dingo does. They're always going to be treated as the enemy. I believe our only option is to destroy the dogs. The dingo, lightning rod of the Australian bush. I can hardly see a single difference between this dog and my Kelpies. There's one real big difference. Hang your on. Kelpies love you and she wants to rip your face off. Dingoes can ruin your day. They can run you right out of business. Wipe out a year's profit in just one night. Walk on sheep, walk on sheep. I know. I'm a sheep farmer and dog trainer. Oi, oi, my name oi, is David oi. Graham. I grew up farming sheep and cattle. It's in my blood. My whole life I've been taught that dingoes are the enemy. For generations, my family's trapped poisoned and shot them, but they always come back. And now, it seems like they are more of a threat than they ever were. Good dogs, good dogs, good dogs. Steady now, steady dog. Dogs are my life. You can't run a station without them, and I've been training them for years. I know I'll make some tick. I just can't get a handle on dingoes. As a farmer, I fear them, but as a dog trainer, I respect them. I admire their independence. I've got to believe there's a way to control them without wiping them out. Scientists say the dingo arrived in Australia somewhere around three and a half thousand to five thousand years ago. Sandy, black or somewhere in between, they're all dingoes. Not far removed from their Asian wolf ancestors. Probably brought along by Indonesian seafarers as food or maybe as a hunting tool. When dingoes got to Australia, the apex predator was the thylacine, the Tassie tiger. The dingo was bigger than most Tassie tigers and a far more adaptable hunter. They competed for food and territory and dingoes most likely hunted down their smaller competitor. Thylacines disappeared from mainland Australia about 3,000 years ago. The last one died in a Tasmanian zoo in 1936 and now they're gone forever. The dingo became Australia's top predator. For thousands of years, indigenous Australians lived with the dingo. People of the Western Desert kept them as camp dogs, believing they kept evil spirits away and warning the camp if strangers approached. But they weren't pets for long. When the pups got a bit older, they became more independent and nicked off into the bush.
When Europeans arrived with sheep and cattle, we dug bore wells all over this hot, dry country. Suddenly there was fresh water where none had existed. The numbers of animals shot up, including dingoes. And we did something else. We brought domestic dogs. They've escaped into the bush and interbred with dingoes. The result seems to be a more fearless wild dog that's spread across Australia. And calves and sheep are an easy target. Today, my prime lambs are going to auction. Dingoes or wild dogs, it doesn't matter. Seems like us farmers are at war to protect our livelihood. It's time I hit the road to get some answers. How big a problem are dingoes? Where do they fit in the ecology of Australia? And how can we live together on this land? What I'm trying to do here is, is learn everything that I can about the, the dingo and how it interacts across Australia, because it doesn't matter which part of Australia you're at, there are different issues at play. I'm heading across Australia, looking for a way to end this war with dingoes, or at least call a truce. My first stop, four hours east of my farm at the sale yards in Warwick. It's an area that didn't used to have dog problems until recently. With the drought broken, this land is green. The numbers of every animal out here has exploded, including dingoes. I'm in 78.50, everything now. Where are you, fellas? Oh, help the go, Solomon, GR. You know, Australia used to ride on the sheep's back. But in the last few years, there's been a lot of changes. The major change being there are so few farmers in the industry compared to what they used to be. Those that are left are facing a new crisis. That is one from wild dogs. A problem we haven't seen for 50 years. And in each of these pens, you see a farmer's profit or the damage that a single dog can do in one night. Good arm, Dave. Ben, Corey, Dave. Good day, Ben. Peter. Dave, Peter. Ross Bartley, Dave. How are you? Good, good. It's really... Uh, Every farmer here has a story about dingoes and wild dogs. I saw one morning 30 lambs, small lambs, dead, all from one dog. Just went through and just bang, just bit, bit like that. Yeah. And is it is it town dogs that have gone feral, or is it real dingoes coming out of the bush, or is it a hybrid? Real dingoes, there's, there's, there's both. You'll see the domestic dogs that go feral. Mm. They're probably worse than a dingo in some respects. Mm -hmm. um, but as I say, they've all got the same traits. Mm. All they want to do is kill. If you see any sort of dog chasing a, a, a flock of sheep around and maiming them, they automatically fall into the category of wild dog and need to be destroyed. It doesn't matter where the dogs come from, what his genetics are, if he's killing sheep, he's a problem. Oh, that's right. Absolutely. Peter, what would happen if, if the wild dog took a hold in this country and he wasn't controlled? Well, well sheep, sheep, sheep are everything to us. We'd lose our bloody livelihood. Yeah. We'd be finished. We're really getting into it now. We've been going for, we've been These blokes are doing it tough, and the native dingo is in the firing line. Mm. So, Ross, do you reckon the, the native dog should be protected in any way? Well, I've yet to be um, convinced that they are a native dog. I don't believe they're really a native of this country. I reckon they're an introduced species. They're always going to be treated as the enemy. I believe our only option is to destroy the dogs. I understand how these sheep farmers feel about wild dogs and dingoes. Basic canine instinct is they're hardwired to attack anything that runs away. And sheep, well, they're perfect. Small enough not to be intimidating and fast enough to be exciting. And worst of all, they respond to dogs by mobbing up. So dingoes don't stop at just one. There's hundreds of wild dogs in isolated pockets doing a lot of damage, but it could be worse. There's a lot more wild dogs out there, and the only thing stopping them is the dingo fence. Only a few hundred kilometres away, there's a thin fence, and that's all that's there. 
and that's dividing all this grazing pasture land from the wild dogs. I want to see it for myself. I'm heading to a cattle station just across the fence in South Australia where there are thousands of dingoes. There's precious few travellers out here. A reminder of just how vast Australia is. What amazes me is how much life I'm seeing on this side of the fence. It's kind of hard to imagine that all this tough country is divided up into stations. Tens of thousands of square kilometres, with water points scattered all over. And out here, in the middle of nowhere, is the barrier that divides the country. The dingo fence. A few thousand kilometres that way. And you reach my home. A few thousand more kilometres that way. And you reach the Southern Ocean and the Great Australian Bight. And through here, just on this one station alone, I hear there's five to seven thousand dingoes. The fence runs over five and a half thousand kilometres, one of the longest man-made structures ever built. In fact, it's three times the length of the Great Wall of China. Begun in 1886, it crosses three states, beginning in southeast Queensland and ending on the shores of South Australia. It was originally built to keep rabbits out of the northern grazing lands. Back in the early 1900s, sheep farmers realised that it might protect their whole industry from dingoes. I can't imagine what it must have taken to build this thing across this bloody tough land. With the heat, the flies and the dust. Across the fence is Quinnaby Station. Covering 12,000 square kilometres, it stretches to the edge of the Strzelecki Desert. This is one of the largest cattle stations in South Australia, if not the world. I can tell right away that things are different on the dingo side of the fence. I haven't seen any roos, emus or goats. But I'm seeing plenty of signs that this is dingo territory. This is great. You know, usually when you come into a state or a, a town, there's a big sign saying, welcome to. That's exactly what this is doing. This dog saying, this is my country, and you're in it. And it's fairly good acrobatics to get that up there, too, when you think about how high a dog is and how much you must have to... You get what I'm talking about. I'm here to catch up with Greg Connors, the station manager. Always a good idea to check in with the boss when you're wandering around their land. G'day, mate. There you go. Good, good. Ah. Greg's been running cattle in the outback for over 30 years. There's nearly 8,000 head on Quinnaby. He says in tough country like this, you always lose some calves. The natural loss is you've got to account for 4 to 6 per cent health, accidents, whatever. Greg says stations out here can lose 25% more to dingoes. It's got to account for a fair bit of that extra percentage. That's the only difference is the dogs. It's a dog fence and the dogs, yep, yep. What I've seen of these cattle is that they look after their calves. They do, but you get eight to ten dogs. The cow cannot look after a calf with that many dogs coming in from all angles. She just physically can't do it. But it's not just outright predation that's a problem. Dingoes cause havoc on a more basic level, water. Here's a good example, Dave, of dogs chewing cables. I put this unit out here the other day, and two hours after I come back just on dark to start it to get extra water, and that absolutely chewed this cable straight through. And if I hadn't been here that time, well, obviously we would have been out of water. 
Friday. So uh, it's not the, just the direct predation on the livestock by killing them and harassing them, it's when they bugger up your wires and your water system that you don't have water and that's when big numbers perish. Well, you can happen very easily. They're just like playing with things like your domestic dog does and they'll destroy things. If it's there and it's chewable, they'll chew it. That's dead right. <laughs> When the dogs get too bold, Greg and his crew fight back with guns and another weapon, 1080 Bates. Meat laced with poison. It doesn't take much to kill a dingo. A tiny bit goes a long way. Even so, hundreds of kilograms of 1080 poison is spread by aircraft each year across the outback. And any dog that eats it dies an ugly death. I'm seeing dingoes right around the homestead and it's got me thinking about my own experience using poison. I'd come to the conclusion that baiting didn't work. That baiting was really ineffective with dingoes and you ended up hurting your own dogs more than you hurt wild dogs. But after seeing what he has to contend with out here, it's, it really is the only way. And I think that's what I'm learning is that there are solutions for areas, for certain places. It is not a one size fits all. This morning I'm heading further into dingo territory to meet a man whose job is tracking dingoes. This is about as outback as it gets. In this arid land, water points like this dam attract every animal around. Ben Allen researches dingo management for New South Wales Department of Primary Industries. Better go check it out. He looks at their behaviour, predation on livestock, and how to control them on these vast cattle stations. He's got nine dingoes out here with GPS collars on them. And the fastest way to track them is from the air. Ben's radio direction finder gets us in the right area, but spotting dingoes is another matter. He's round here somewhere. Brumbies, wild horses. First sign of life I've seen out here besides dingoes. There's one. This dingo is pacing us at about 60 kilometers an hour. Nothing seems to slow him down. The stamina of these animals is amazing. Tracking these animals gives Ben information about where they go and what they do, like never before. And he's got more collars to put on these dogs. Getting this data from this stuff's like Christmas morning. I can plug this thing into the computer and get a GPS point for every half hour of his life for the wow. last 12 months. That's so a phenomenal like, amount of information. Oh, you, you can see who he hung out with, when he hung out with them, when he went and had a drink, when he didn't have a drink. And through the, some of this stuff, we found out dogs can go three weeks without a drink. Three weeks? Three weeks. Well, they obviously need water. They mm. can't go without water, but they're not getting their water from a dam. They're mm. getting their water out of blood and maybe the fat reserves they've got in their body and that sort of stuff. They're not getting it from a, a puddle. We've got collars on several pack members of the same pack, mm -hmm. and we've got that in several packs. Mm. This is the same map with two different dogs. And this dog here lives on this side of the road, and this dog here lives on that side of the road. So the road is really important uh, feature that separates the pack boundaries. And then 
you can start to look at interactions between pack individuals and packs end with other things like water points. So you can yeah. say, do, does everyone go to the water point at the same time or do they go at different times? This is all good and well when it comes to understanding how dogs act amongst themselves, but this is a massive three million acre cattle property. How do the dogs interact with the cattle? For me, that is the most important question. To answer it, I've got to show you some stuff in here. Here's a laptop. Just a little while ago, I come across this pack of dingoes eating this dead cow. With all the cows totally oblivious hanging around. Complete indifference. There's 12 dogs there, 12 dingoes feeding on a dead cow in the presence of probably 100 cattle, probably 30 calves. As though it happens all the time. As though it happens all the time. That cow's obviously died from something, the dingoes are eating it. And there's even more dingoes up on the hill. Yeah. Now these ones were the adults. Right. They'd already had their feed. Now it's the pup's turn to have their feed. So just this little video shows so much about this pack structure. Absolutely. We learn who's more important and who's in charge and who isn't. Yep. You learn about the behaviour of the calves. If this was in sheep country, that just wouldn't happen. Sheep don't react that way to dogs. Sheep bleat, they form a big group, they carry on, yep. and dogs just have to kill them. It's, they're hardwired to kill mm. things that when run away. When they see the movement, when they see the noise, they have triggers. to do it, yeah. which is why on this side of the fence it's just all cattle stations. Absolutely. Dogs and cattle can live together under the right management. Dogs and sheep just can't live together. To put GPS collars on dingoes, first, you've got to catch them. Not so easy on a station this big. We're checking traps been set across the desert. Okay. Right there. These are rubber jawed traps. They hold tight, but they don't harm the animal. I have no idea how he's going to get a collar and a wild dog. I think I'm going to let you do it. <laughs> so, with this, this knob pulls yep. back and it loosens it off. There you go, beautiful. Pin him down. Drop the pole. She's right now. This is extraordinary. I'm looking at the, the face of this dog. And I can hardly see a single difference between this dog and my Kelpies. There's one real big difference. Hang on, your Kelpies on. love you and she wants to rip your face off. <laughs> so we're going to put this on. So she's right now. Let's put this collar on first up, before we let her run away with $5,000 of equipment, we make sure it's working. Mm -hmm. Wave a magnet. We only keep the weight of the collar to be less than 5% of their body weight, mm -hmm. so we know they can handle it happily. It doesn't stop them from doing anything. Mm -hmm. So she's all ready to go now. You can see the importance of um, this type of trap, eh? These traps are great. Unbelievable. Ben gives the dog's foot a rub to help get the blood flow back. Massaging her foot like this is nothing compared to being beaten up by a couple of other dogs, so yeah. they, don't even, they don't even flinch. So she's all good now. I'm going to give this pole to you. And what I want you to do is just gently come off her, and then when you're ready, just lean down Put your finger in the corner of that tape and pull it off. Yep. Okay. So you all right with that? Yep, no worries. All right. Before you do that, come back around this side. Otherwise, you can take something most precious to you. A dog in this situation could have any of four responses. Fight, flight, fidget or freeze. There's no way to predict what she'll do. She's free, she just doesn't know it yet. She's frozen. As a dog trainer, I've seen this reaction before. Yeah, there's a behaviour that I know very, very well. That was a look away, which, which to me says, if I look away, I'm not going to attack you, so don't you attack me, which yeah. is 
classic Very submissive. Dog Tail between behavior. her legs, ears yeah. down, yeah. looking away. All the things that you'd read in a good dog handling textbook. Exactly. I don't think she's going to go anywhere. <laughs> what we might do, I reckon, is if we get back in the car and maybe back off, she might get up and just wander off. Ben likes to make sure his dingoes are okay when they walk off. Once we're in the car, he reckons she won't see us as a threat. She'll get hot eventually and leave. Want a biscuit? <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> Might as well. We're going to be here for a while. There she goes. Just like that. Finally had enough. <laughs> She's had enough. And so have we. We make camp back at the dam. Even with us moving around and making a racket, dingoes still come in to check us out. There's a lot of dingoes on this side of the fence. They may take a calf, but it's not their primary diet. They're mostly out hunting rabbits and other small mammals at night. Can you hear? Yeah, yeah. It's a welcoming committee. I'll tell you what, Ben. If, um, if I hadn't actually come out and flown around today and seen the number of dogs... So when I tell everyone in New South Wales that there's a lot of dogs on the other side of the fence, I'm not just pulling their chain. There no, really is a lot of dogs on this side of the fence. I couldn't believe it. And what would happen if the fence just went yesterday? Would you just get this mass migration of dogs? It wouldn't take them very long to realise that can you hear that? Yeah. You should ask them that question. <laughs> what they would do if the fence was down. And you can hear their answer. They're going, woohoo! <laughs> yeah. Out here, dingoes are adapted to hot and dry. But they live everywhere in Australia from the coast to the alpine regions. I want to know what the physical traits are that make these animals so successful. What makes them different from other dogs? I head to the Dingo Discovery Centre in Victoria, just outside Melbourne. This one actually we, we bought in from... Lynn Watson is a dog breeder, and I hope she can give me some answers. She founded the Dingo Discovery Centre 12 years ago to try to preserve the genetic purity of dingoes. Lynn knows the traits and characteristics of all dogs, and she's got a very definite opinion on what makes dingoes different. There's definite differences. Look at its head in, in relation to its chest, you know? It's, the head of a dingo is huge. It has a big brain, it has big wide cheekbones here. Mm -hmm. and that always makes it the widest part of the animal because wherever that fits in the wild the rest has got to follow right you look at any dog you like and yeah. you'll find the opposite you'll find that the head skull will always fit in between the front legs yeah have a look at this mm -hmm. and look at the orbits of the eyes this mm -hmm. is a dingo his eyes are placed on his head 45 degrees mm -hmm. that means if he's standing still and looking one direction his peripheral vision is 180. Wow. Without turning his head. Yeah. Like here is a, a dog skull. Mm -hmm. And I'd say this is some sort of a beagle. You see how it's flared out here mm -hmm. around the nose? And you can see this animal hasn't got anything like the peripheral vision mm. of the dingo. The, if it's a beagle type, the, the eyes are just following the nose, really, aren't they? Exactly. Have a look at this. A dingo has the ability to be able to turn his head right around past his backbone. Right. Look, he can turn his head right round a little oh, bit wow. from there. Oh, my goodness. Now, you go home and try that with your dog, but you'll probably break his neck. And you know, I won't try that with my girl. <laughs> wow. Now, all of his joints are mm -hmm. double-jointed. He can get an egg out through the fence and mm -hmm. put it in his paws and pull it through 
without breaking it. That's incomprehensible. That is, I'm not, I'm not going to go, I'm not going to do it to you, buddy. But that is pretty amazing. Yeah, and look at his ears. He's the listening to you right that ear. Yeah. And he can look around the back and listen out the back. Yeah. And I think that's what part of this big bone, feel the bone. You feel that bone? You yeah, see? yeah. Feel that there? Oh, my God. Yeah. That's a dingo. I'm gaining a newfound respect for the dingo and the physical traits that make them special. They're the epitome of a survivor. It's hard to believe how many there are and how well they do in a land as big and as hard as this. They're adapted to a boom and bust environment that runs from dry as dust to torrential storms. Phenomenal driving through this desert country and um, extremely marginal for even grazing and yet here we are, it's raining. Dingoes have been here for thousands of years. They've learned to ride the seasons and live in balance with native plants and animals. But when the Europeans arrived, they introduced the game changers, foxes, cats and rabbits. And in under 200 years, these feral species wiped out many of the small native mammals from the land. I'm headed out west to one place where you can still see them. On the other side of Lake Eyre in South Australia, near the town of Roxby Downs, tracts of land are fenced off, carved out of cattle country in a unique experiment, arid recovery. Behind the fences, scientists are looking at how native mammals influence the land, the effects of cats and foxes, and the role of dingoes. Arid recovery was started 15 years ago by scientists including Catherine Mosby, and it's become a magnet for visiting scientists like Dr Mike Letnick. Inside their fences, they say you can see what Australia used to be like, G'day guys, how's it going? Good. Good, thanks. So what are we looking at? Just looking at some tracks at the moment. We've got a larista here and a, a few hopping mice. It's phenomenal, Betong. the amount of tracks. So one of the ways we monitor other animals here is we actually count the tracks. Okay. So we'll walk along the top of the dunes and we'll count how many tracks per kilometre of all the different species. Have you got enough people to count the number of tracks? <laughs> it takes a while. Looks like a plains rat track, that one there. A lot of these tracks, I wouldn't even have a clue what they are. Well, most of them are probably extinct on the mainland anyway, so right. you probably wouldn't see them if you just walked around outside. But the only reason you're seeing them here is because we've got rid of the cats and the foxes and the rabbits, and we've reintroduced them, or they've naturally moved into the area, and this is what it used to be like. Right. Just 50 metres away, there's another area with cats, foxes and rabbits that's like most of Australia, and I see a very different story. It doesn't take very much to see here when you look around that um, it's just not the same highway. No. Um, you know, it's just not as busy. There's, I mean, there are still a, there's a handful of hopping mouse tracks still, but nothing like the number we saw before. There's a bit of fox hit. The problem out here in, in this system is it's dominated by foxes, cats, rabbits, kangaroos. A lot of our, the native mammals, the small mammals, like the hopping mice, they, ha they just haven't got a chance. On this side of the fence, their food's eaten out by kangaroos, and if they stick their head up out of their holes, they get chomped on by a fox or a, or a cat. So in other words, they don't have a chance out here. None. The dingo fence that stretches across Australia is part of Arid Recovery's northern boundary. I thought we answered this question. It's like another level of Catherine's experiments, because on the other side, there are dingoes. There's a lot of research that's showing that when you've got dingoes, you get more small mammals. But a lot of our arid zone threatened species are actually only present north of the dog fence. Is it the dingo that's encouraging the species through their picking off of the uh, middle order predators? Yep. If you don't have that top order predator, you get the cats and foxes increasing and, and, and wreaking havoc on a lot of the native animals. The native species are tough to spot during the day but you can see them in Arid Recovery's reserve at night. 
Ellen Crisp is one of Arid Recovery's resident ecologists. She's introducing me to some mammals that have been gone from mainland Australia for decades, but are thriving here. So that's, that's a betong, is it? Yeah, that's a burrowing betong. There's another burrowing betong coming towards us here. Yeah. Because they've got no fear at all. No, they're so humans. inquisitive. He's actually the only macropod species to live in a warren, and they live underground and come out at night. So is all these little scurrying critters along here, are they all just plague mice? No, what, uh, the spin effects hopping mice. In hopping mice? Area. Yeah, hopping mice. So you oh, can they see fully them. hop? Yeah, they fully hop. Wow. It's really cool. Oh, and there he goes, off into the dune. Do you reckon I can catch him? Give it a go! <laughs> I got him, I knew this wow. hat would come in handy. He Good is job. awesome. He is awesome. So you can see he looks quite different from the house mice that you might see at home or yeah, in the, yeah. the barn or anything. The main difference with these guys is their really, really long tail. Yeah. And that real feathery tip on the end of it. And their mm. really long back legs. Yeah. Big eyes. Yeah. What we've found from our research here is that there's six times more small mammals like these guys inside the reserve where there's no feral cats and foxes mm. compared to outside the reserve. I think he's saying to me I should let him go. Yeah, I think so. We've had a go great look at him. Go and meet your girlfriend. Go and make some babies. <laughs> One of Helen's jobs is to patrol the perimeter of the reserve, some 70 kilometres of fences. So this keeps everything out, rabbits, foxes, dingoes. Yep, everything. and cat. As part of the study, they've set traps outside the reserve to learn how much damage feral animals are doing to native species. Oh, wow. Black one. Yeah. Here we've got a feral cat. We'll um, dispose of him and we'll um, check out what he's been eating. This one is actually 3.625 kilos. Helen records details of every catch to learn what cats and foxes are living on out here. And this oh is God, it. It's full ass. It's really full. So because we're, we want to find out ideally what species these animals are eating, yeah. it's really important to get all the bits and pieces. Sort of like putting together a jigsaw puzzle, I guess. So what we want to find are the different legs and tails that belong to the different species out here. I mean, they're obviously some sort of a, a mouse or a rat. Is yeah. that the native? We've got at least one Spinifex hopping mouse. Helen tells me that one cat caught here had 33 native animals in its gut from one day's hunting. And scientists estimate there's 15 million wild cats across Australia. Seeing what just one eats, it beggars belief how many small animals they consume. To test the theory that dingoes can control cat and fox numbers, Arid Recovery set up another experiment. They put a pair of dingoes in a 37 square kilometre reserve. Then they introduce cats and foxes. With um, the first phase of our dingo project, we introduced seven foxes into the, the dingo pen area. Um, and over, you know, a course of a few weeks, we did find dingoes were killing foxes. Turns out they also killed five out of eight cats that were set loose in the pen too. Dingoes are pretty good at knocking off ferals. Wow. So this is the um, dam inside the dingo pen. And straight through the dunes there, we've actually established a carcass dump. Mm -hmm. And this area is actually a really great place to observe dingoes in the dingo pen. So fingers crossed, we might see some. Oh, wow. <laughs> so that's the carcass. Do you've, when you've laid that? Uh, yeah, we've put that out um, about a day ago. Yeah. Dingoes eat anything. They're opportunists. They take down rabbits, roos and small mammals. They eat reptiles, insects, plants and they'll even scavenge on carrion. And I'm hoping that kangaroo carcass is irresistible.
Now, it's a waiting game, trying to keep still, and my eyes open. Dingo hearing and sense of smell is so good, we'd be lucky to see anything. Now, what's the likelihood that the parents would, would, would keep observing their pups and be in the local area but avoiding yep. the fact that we're here? Yeah, I reckon it's pretty likely. Um, when I saw the pups a couple of weeks ago, I actually heard howling. Um, the howling was most likely coming from one of the parents, but I did not see them at all. Oh, so. But they are cute. <laughs> they are cute, yeah. <laughs> I leave Roxby Downs with a new appreciation for the dingo. It seems that a healthy ecosystem needs a top order predator. They keep ferals in check, which helps small native species. And they also keep roo numbers down, which means more grazing for livestock. Now more than ever, I feel that there's got to be a way for farmers and dingoes to coexist. I'm headed into prime sheep country, the border of New South Wales and Victoria, to the town of Talangata. This country couldn't be more different from the desert. But even here, they've got trouble with dogs. G'day, Andrew. Dave, is it? Yes. How you going, mate? Hey, how are you? Good, good, good. Now, I hear you. Oh, come in. I think we've only got a couple on, somewhere. G'day. Chad, I'm Linda. Nice to meet you. Good, thank you. Please have a seat. Glenda and Andrew Barron have been here all their lives. Fourth generation to run sheep in these hills. But they were almost run out of business. Almost lost everything. All because of wild dogs. It was the lambs we lost and it was the pain and everything else that um, we suffered too, watching our animals suffer. The men would walk in the back door and um, I didn't have to ask. I could see by the looks of their faces um, that something had happened for the animals. And they were just cruel and relentless. Every night we'd hear this noise and you could hear sheep bleating. It was impossible. Over three years, all but about 50 of nearly 2,000 of the lambs were killed. This is one night's damage. When a dog bites anything, it's not a clean bite. They're full of contamination and bacteria and they just... Within four or five days, they'll just infect up and die. It's a horrible, horrible, horrible death. And you know, look, look at that one. With just the guts ripped out and just hanging down. Yeah, they wouldn't last uh, probably a couple of days, probably. But you imagine the death they're going through, you know. The, the pain. Yeah, the pain, yeah. The... You were saying earlier that fishermen get stalked yeah. in this high country by these packs of wild dogs. The men rarely ever go up the hills now without a gun in case they see a dog. Um, one of my sons and the grandchildren all love fishing. It's only a matter of time. And they are getting gamer and gamer. Andrew and Glenda were at the end of their tether when they decided to take one last shot at preserving their livelihood. Six years ago, they bought two Marema guardian dogs and raise them from pups to guard their sheep. Marimas originated in Italy over 2,000 years ago, bred to protect flocks against wolves. With their floppy ears and calm disposition, they don't scare the sheep. They identify the flock as their companions and they'll protect them against any intruder, even people they don't know. Hello. So these guys here is what's changed your whole operation and made you able to yeah, stay in shape. They're my lifesavers, these blokes. Yeah, yeah. yeah the old bloke there. I got Andrew them. says that since the Maremmas joined his flock, the attacks have stopped. Um, the old bloke's he's a bit of a loner, but off he goes. He's come, he's checked you out, he reckons yeah. you're not a threat, and he's going back yeah. his, his sheep. These guardian dogs are lifesavers for Andrew and Glenda. Their sheep are safer 
even with wild dogs still around the farm. Linda van Bommel is a researcher at Australian National University. For the past two years, she's included Andrew and Glenda's Maremmas in a study on how guardian dogs protect sheep. I caught up to her at the beginning of her workday. Linda van Bommel, I presume? Yes, hi! I thought I was never going to find you. <laughs> it I'll tell you rather... what, you have the most beautiful office space in the history of the universe. It's good, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Excellent. What you're trying to do here is understand how it is that the Maremmas actually do their job. Yes, because, well, it's pretty obvious that they're very good at protecting sheep or cattle or whatever other livestock mm -hmm. people have. But how do they do it? Linda's using sound and scent to test the Maremmas' reactions to wild dogs. So we're going to set it up kind of a bit sheltered on this bush. Uh -huh. The dingo's howl is like a territorial sign. Linda wants to know how the guardian dogs respond. She sets up the speaker, some remotely triggered cameras, and a little dingo urine. Scent is really important for dogs. If you have a wild dog or a dingo come through on the property, you don't expect it to only make a noise, right. but as any dog, it'll just lift its leg. So I, I'm really interested in finding out well, how the Maremas react to that as well. Linda programs a timer to set off the speaker after we've hidden. The Maremmas are nearly a kilometre away, keeping an eye on their sheep. From the cover of the bush, we keep an eye on the dogs. Oh my God, that's it, instant. Even at this distance, the Maremmas are up and looking for the enemy. They've zeroed right in on the source. If it was a real wild dog in this paddock, he'd be facing some stiff resistance. The Maremmas are big, much larger than any dingo or wild dog. The remote cameras show that wild dogs are still around and active at night, and so are the Maremmas. Linda says the sheep are safe because the Maremmas have marked this area as their territory. And in the dog world, you don't trespass without a fight. This is all starting to make some sense to me now. Maybe guardian dogs are part of the solution I've been looking for. But Marimas can't protect stock on the massive cattle stations. There's just too much land. There's a place in the very heart of Australia that's taken a whole different approach, where cattle and dingoes are left alone to coexist. This remote cattle station is a study site for Arian Wallach, an ecologist with James Cook University. With her is author and researcher Adam O'Neill. They say this place is different because for the last year, dingoes here have been left in peace. Well, here we are in Dingo Utopia. What do you think of the dam? It is amazing how the, the water's not fouled up at all. And the amount of vegetation I'm seeing around the dam is astonishing. What's especially surprising is all the new growth of plants that herbivores love to eat. And Arian and Adam say it's all because of the dingo. That's Look. a mulga. Now that is so special. Oh, Without the dingoes, this thing would never survive. It would get munched off by rabbits, kangaroos, cows. So I know your travels, Dave. Have you ever seen anything like this, this environment, around this town? <sighs> Man, I've got to be honest with you. Uh, palatable vegetation like this around a waterhole is unheard of. I mean, the behaviour of livestock is... It's easier. 
if you get a feed right where you're having a drink. And so when the cows come in, the calves, of course, are going to have a bit of a feed around and you're going to lose all the vegetation. Exactly. And water is also the center of, of the dingoes' lives. Mm -hmm. It's the center of their territories. It's where a lot of their hunting and communication happens. And so if dingoes are allowed to uh, persist, you actually get the grazing moving out because this is the most dangerous place for a herbivore to be. So, in fact, the, the dingoes are actually allowing for regeneration around water. As <laughs> as we see here. Aaron and Adam believe that dingoes can help restore the ecology on a station. I get how more vegetation would mean more prey animals for the dingoes, so they'd leave the cattle alone. But Arian and Adam say the key is a stable pack. When dingoes are persecuted, when they're baited, when they're shot, their pack structure breaks down. Mm -hmm. Their pack structure is very important for their education, mm -hmm. for, their, um, for the stability of their behavior. Yep. And where, um, where persecution happens, for the most part, that's where um, attacks on livestock increase. You basically get a situation where you get a lot of uh, young juvenile delinquents running amok harassing calves. The so it's like taking the older, wiser people out of society and then just leaving all the young people that have got no uh, knowledge about how the best way of society to work is or yes. what's appropriate to eat and what's not appropriate to eat. Yeah. Well, we, we need our elders to teach us knowledge, mm -hmm. to teach us manners, mm -hmm. to teach us rules and regulations mm -hmm. and laws, and dingoes are, are exactly the same. On this station, Dingoes aren't shot, trapped, or poisoned. What I'm hearing is that they're establishing a stable pack structure. And a topwater predator influences everything, right down to the plants. But I have to ask, what about the cattle? It's possible that dingoes will kill an occasional calf. Uh, but, but at the same time, you have a station that's actually sustainable, that can feed, that can produce vegetation through droughts, mm the end of the day, it's actually beneficial for the cattle to have the dingoes in the system. It's a pretty compelling theory that dingoes can actually benefit a station like this. Looking over this land, I've got a whole new view on the dingoes roll out here. Today, Adam's taking me through some amazing country, and everywhere I look, I see dingoes. These animals aren't familiar with people. They don't know to be afraid. We think of dingoes as fierce and aggressive, but out here, where people leave them alone, I'm just seeing curiosity. I wonder if he'll come closer. What I'm going to try and do is make really little weird noises so the dog's going to come and check me out. Hopefully, get a bit closer. Absolutely incredible. We're on thousands and thousands of square kilometres on this station, and to be able to be this close, it's unbelievable. This young dingo is not so different to me. He's trying to make sense of what I am and where I fit in his world. And I'm trying to understand where he fits in mine. The way I think about dingoes has changed so much over this journey. 
I've lost some fear and gained a whole lot of respect. I know why many farmers think of them as the enemy, but now I see how intimately tied the dingo is to the health of our land. Are we missing something and not getting that Australia needs a topwater predator? And it doesn't matter what we do, dogs will slip through the cracks and create their own niche in the environment. And maybe there's a different solution for every situation. Some farmers might have to control dog numbers. Others may be able to use guardian dogs. And for still others, maybe leaving the dingo alone will impose a natural balance on the land. As a species, they have every right to exist. It seems we might need them more than we think. One thing I do know, I can't imagine Australia without them. For the first time in my life, I'm making camp in the bush, and I'm actually glad to know the dingoes are out here. <laughs>